Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us for the 2020 and 2021 medal talks for the Canadian Association of Physicists. So we're now moving on to our um, third talk of the afternoon. And I would like to invite uh, Roger Melko to turn on his microphone and his camera and acknowledge him as the 2021 CAP DCMMP Brockhouse Medal recipient. Roger's from the University of Waterloo and the Perimeter Institute and the award um, recognizes his work on the theoretical understanding of many bottom body quantum systems through large scale computer simulations. The theoretical tools developed by his group provide a new perspective on understanding of quantum condensed matter and have proved highly influential in areas such as quantum information, field theory, cold atomic matter, and artificial intelligence. Welcome, Roger, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's an honor to be here, honor to be awarded the Brockhouse Medal. Uh, thank you to the Canadian Association of Physicists and all the physicists, all of you you know, in, in the community of Canadian physicists um, for this recognition. So I'd like to spend my time uh, talking, you know, maybe waxing philosophical a bit about maybe the future of quantum simulation, uh, you know, drawing on some of the past, I guess, perspectives uh, that brought us to the point where we are today. Um, and, you know, a lot large, uh, uh, part of my career has been spent at the University of Waterloo and more recently at the Perimeter Institute. And so, you know, first off, thanks to both of these wonderful institutions for all the support that they've uh, given me throughout the years. And, um, you know, uh, most of the work that I, I think I'll talk about, uh, you know, basically sort of had its genesis in, in, in these places. Um, so first off, I just wanted to mention the namesake of the medal, uh, you know, Bertrand Brockhaus. And, and, you know, of course, I think as Canadians, um, you know, his contributions to condense, you know, perspectives on condensed matter, you know, and materials physics is, is sort of really in our, our DNA. So before I talk about the future, I just thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, maybe the past and some of the past work we've done. And, uh, you know, this perspective of, of sort of neutrons and neutron scattering uh, ha has really influenced uh, my perspectives on theoretical condensed matter and many body physics, uh, you know, since I started doing uh, research in this area and when I was looking at this I realized it's been 20 years so even though I don't feel like it's been that long uh, it's been quite a while and I sort of started my research career uh, in condensed matter uh, working on the problem of spin ice and spin ice is a fascinating um, sort, of, sort of classification of of I would say you know order or lack thereof uh, in a magnetic system and uh, one of the first works that I was involved in, uh, thanks to, in particular, to my uh, master's degree advisor at the University of Waterloo, Michel Shingra, who, by the way, was the recipient of the Brockhaus Medal, I believe, in 2009. So very inspiring also for me personally, um, was, uh, you know, was the topic of spin ice in specific materials, which are these rare earth uh, titanate materials. So, for example, homium titanate <clears throat> pictured here you know, stuck to a magnet, essentially, a little cr single crystal uh, of homium titanate. And what's remarkable about sort of uh, homium titanate, dysprosium titanate, all the spin ice materials uh, is they show a lack of order at very low temperatures, uh, essentially in their ground state, uh, and an extensive entropy, uh, configurational entropy um, that is equivalent to that of ice water, hence, hence the name spin ice. And you know, a lot of the properties of spin ice were determined through neutron scattering. And so this is figures taken from uh, some early paper I was involved uh, with uh, that involved Tom Fennell and other neutron scatterers uh, who put a single crystal of homium titanate uh, in a beam and got this sort of uh, you know, uh, reciprocal space you know, intensity pattern here. So what Michel Gingra, Byron Den Hertog, myself and others were looking at uh, was the so-called dipolar spin ice model. So it's really a microscopic model uh, of, of the interactions that are occurring you know, in uh, homium titanate. And I've sort of drawn 
uh, a schematic of one of the sort of, uh, you know, units or, uh, of, of the crystal lattice, uh, which is a tetrahedron. And, you know, the magnetic uh, moments uh, live on the corners of the tetrahedron. They, have, they, they can point, point certain directions. And so, sort of what's remarkable about the dipolar spin ice model is that, you, you know, that theoretical model can reproduce the neutron scattering pattern. In particular, uh, you know, some of these intensities, uh, uh, which are kind of diffuse, and the, and the absence of any Bragg peaks, you know, so a, a Bragg peak indicates sort of long range order. And on the experimental side, on the left hand side, you see Bragg peaks that, uh, you know, are basically associated with the, the nuclear, um, you know, the, the, the nuclei here. So the point of these plots is that there's no magnetic order, even though these are very low temperature, uh, 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 you know, uh, very low temperature um, configurations or, or uh, experiments. And so what Michel Gingra really taught me in some sense was, um, you know, number one, kind of the, uh, you know, importance of modeling. Really what we're doing is we're, you know, simulating or building a microscopic model that has a certain Hamiltonian. Uh, that describes the behavior of homium titanate. And number two, he taught me uh, the power of classical simulation techniques, in, in particular Monte Carlo methods. And Monte Carlo methods, you know, you can imagine either the, you know, the magnetic spins of, of the tetrahedra or some other configuration, you know, being sampled through some stochastic process by rolling the dice, you know, flipping spins uh, and, and producing configurations and so on. And that very powerful simulation method. Uh, and, and you know that the fact that a classical uh, model, you know, a, a model with no quantum mechanics in the Hamiltonian can reproduce the behavior of homium titanate uh, was really striking to me. And I, I've sort of carried it with, with me for my uh, entire uh, career. I did my PhD in Santa Barbara, California, UCSB. Uh, under the, um, you know, my, my PhD advisor was Douglas Scalapino, who is uh, a giant in the field of uh, high temperature superconductivity and hover model physics and so on. And uh, I also, you know, my kind of unofficial PhD advisor was Andrew Sandvig, who was at Santa Barbara uh, at the time. He was a student of Doug's 10 years before me. And what Doug and Anders taught me uh, were, were sort of similar perspectives, uh, you know, on the power of numerical simulation uh, in the world of quantum systems. So, you know, spin ice, the model is a classical system. Uh, and many other uh, systems in condensed matter materials, physics, uh, especially say high temperature superconductivity and coup rates and so on are quantum mechanical. And Doug was an early pioneer, perhaps the earliest pioneer of so-called quantum Monte Carlo techniques. And, uh, you know, I just like to you know, point out the literature, some of the you know, uh, kind of important contributions um, in particular that Doug made. And uh, you know, Doug had this, and, and his collaborators had this uh, idea of kind of like um, splitting the action up. They were interested in a certain fermionic action into a bosonic component and the fermionic sort of determin determinant. And this was one of the very first kind of uh, um, uh, manifestations of quantumness in a Monte Carlo method. And, and you know, uh, Doug and, and his co-authors co point out some very interesting things in this seminal article. Uh, particularly, you know, D, that determinant can become negative or complex. And, and you know, Monte Carlo is, is based on stochastic uh, sampling. So you have to roll a dice and, and, and have a probability. And if you have a negative or a complex number, uh, you know, it's, it's just something that you can't interpret as a probability. That's kind of the simple way of, of saying it. Uh, and so quantum Monte Carlo is based on this idea that there's certain uh, systems or certain Hamiltonians or certain actions uh, that can be modeled or can be interpreted as having a probabilistic uh, nature and some that can't. And, and you know, the ones that can't are, are called either sign problematic or, or non-stochastic or something like this. And, and, you know, basically in this, you know, uh, early paper of, of my advisors, uh, he basically said, you know, this quantum Monte Carlo approach would be useful and, uh, and convergent, provided that there are not important cancellations between the regions of function space in which the determinant is opposite signs. And nowadays we understand, you know, those interferences to be something that's intrinsically quantum mechanical about certain, uh, uh, certain systems. And one important, you know, perspective Andrew Sandvig gave me on quantum Monte Carlo is it's... Uh, sort of perspective is a D plus one dimensional cl you know, classical representation of a quantum system. 
And, and you know, we may be uh, taking a spatial dimension or a spatial arrangement of spins uh, and, and, you know, performing a Euclidean path integral in D plus one dimensions. And, you know, looking at the interference patterns of the world lines of these spins. And so basically, as long as any signs or complex numbers cancel, uh, this is something that can be simulated classically. Nowadays, we understand, you know, this is the fermionic language. We understand sign problems to be affecting all sorts of quantum systems, you know, particularly ones that have uh, a certain sign structure to their off diagonal matrix elements in, in their Hamiltonian uh, combined with frustration. And this is really important for, you know, some of the physics that we're interested in studying, you know, when we uh, talk about, uh, you know, condensed matter materials systems and an analogy to spin ice, which is a remarkable system that shows kind of a lack of, of long range order at low temperatures. Uh, you know, these, this motif of frustration is very important for the quantum version of this physics, uh, which are, which are the so-called spin liquids. And in Santa Barbara and after I left Santa Barbara, we spent quite a bit of time, you know, searching for, uh, you know, candidate, let's call them systems where uh, spin liquids can occur. Uh, and so here's an example of a bosonic system we studied uh, shortly after, I guess, my postdoc or something like that. Uh, where we were looking for a, a zero temperature uh, phase that is has no order. So again, back to neutron scattering, here are sort of intensities of, of, of spin spin or boson density density correlations, which show an absence of Bragg peaks down to very low temperatures. And you know, we understand as a community that at, in the quantum mechanical description of such quantum spin liquids, uh, there are certain constraints in the theories that force, you know, uh, all sorts of non-trivial topological, let's call it uh, order de degeneracies to occur. Uh, and one of the big un kind of answered questions, I think, was if we're searching for these exotic types of uh, order or lack thereof, but we have no Bragg peaks in the neut neutron scattering or we have no order parameters in the Landau sense, well, how do we have a positive indicator uh, of this type of physics. And so that led me and many other people kind of in, you know, the 20, late 20 knots and 2010s to look at ideas of, of entanglement entropy. And, you know, many uh, condensed matter physicists worked on the concept of topological entanglement entropy. So if I cool down on this phase diagram, I can find signatures in the entanglement entropy and here is a method we uh, developed for use in Quantum Monte Carlo to measure the entanglement entropy. And these lines can be considered kind of the entanglement analogy to long range order, maybe long range entanglement, which would occur in these topological phases. So very powerful tool. But in analogy to the sign problem, uh, you know, the occurrence of large amount of an entanglement in quantum systems also has consequences for the simulatable, simulatability, if that's a word, uh, of quantum systems. So whether or not, uh, you know, we can, you know, efficiently use, uh, you know, conventional computing uh, techniques to discover uh, and simulate properties of uh, these systems. And the connection was made very concretely by one of, um, you know, my, my close friends, collaborators, and one of Scalapino's ex postdocs, Steve White, uh, who invented the so-called density matrix renormalization group, uh, which we now understand is sort of a tensor network uh, math, uh, sort of tensor network onsets uh, for quantum wave functions, which takes you know a large degree, you know, a large amount of classical parameters, maybe two to the n for two level systems, and boils it down to something that is um, uh, you know tractable, is non exponential, and does so assuming that wave functions that live in, you know, quantum many body wave functions that live in reality, sort of our physical uh, corner of Hilbert space tend to have relatively low entanglement. And so a concrete connection was made by uh, this work and, uh, you know, the, the ability for conventional simulations of quantum systems. So today, I think, you know, taking all of these ingredients and, and asking a question, you know, what makes simulations of quantum systems hard? And, and, you know, what systems can we successfully simulate, like spin ice or bosonic systems or systems without the sign problem? Uh, you know, what separates those from systems which are difficult to simulate, like the Hubbard model of high temperature superconductivity 
or frustrated quantum magnets or something like that. And, you know, again, the sign structure, very important, or, you know, the, the, this kind of realness or complexness of the fermionic uh, determinant or, you know, the fermionic statistics in, 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 in certain cases. I think this is fairly well understood. It's known that there, you know, there's a fairly small subset of, of quantum systems in the world that have a favorable sign structure for things like Monte Carlo. Similarly, there's a fairly, uh, you know, small, uh, but, uh, you know, finite set of systems, uh, quantum systems, which have low entanglement. Uh, and that also has a dimensionality uh, component to it. So it's typically one dimensional systems, uh, which makes uh, quantum, these types of quantum systems amenable to uh, tensor network methods. And so sign structures, you know, uh, entanglement structures, and in today's day and age with the advent of, of like advanced optimization techniques and auto differentiation and and machine learning and so on. I would add ergodicity and optimization to uh, the list of things that can make a classical simulation or a conventional simulation easy or hard. Okay, so we kind of have an interplay of these three things which manifest themselves very differently uh, in different physical systems uh, to say, yeah, this, is, this is possible, you can simulate this, this is impossible and, and you can't. And so even with all this knowledge, there's still, I think many systems that we believe that quantum systems, many body systems that we believe that we don't have an efficient simulation strategy for, okay? And, you know, many of these were just kind of stuck. We don't understand the mechanism, if you will, behind high temperature superconductivity because of this. But in today's day and age, there's sort of a new, um, you know, I guess tool in our arsenal. And that's, I would say, very generally speaking, quantum computers. And what, what quantum computers or quantum devices in the near term can give us uh, is sort of experimental access to some of these interesting but difficult simulation, uh, sorry, difficult, uh, uh, interesting but difficult systems uh, in, in, a, in a real, you know, we call it quantum simulation, but it's, it's a real, I guess, emulation of the physics. So as an example, here's a crystal of lithium homium fluoride, which is described the microscopic interactions by this Hamiltonian. And in, in the previous slides, I might be interested in understanding the equilibrium, you know, neutron scattering or dynamical properties or more general, generally like how the state, uh, you know, at some time can be evolved by a unitary operations to, to become some new state, the time, you know, the time evolution. But instead of, you know, if this is difficult for me to simulate, instead, I can prepare this in a rudimentary uh, you know, quantum computer or today's version of a quantum computer, which actually isn't all that rudimentary. And so, you know, there's another sort of aspect to quantum simulation where uh, I have a quantum computer that emulates this Hamiltonian and it produces measurements, you know, by collapsing a, the wave function and giving me a data set of, of measurements in a certain basis. Uh, and, you know, these devices that we have today are, are as you know, approaching the, the, the power of the, the computational uh, simulations that we ourselves, uh, you know, perform uh, classically. So we're really beginning, to, we're entering this age of sort of competition uh, with the quantum devices uh, be, between these two sort of, uh, uh, I'd say, strategies for simulation. And in the quantum devices, we can also perform uh, all sorts of arbitrary sort of unitary evolutions uh, in, in circuit models. And so, you know, what the quantum devices are giving us is data. And, uh, you know, we can, again, combine this data with some of our uh, uh, conventional approaches. And so this is my last slide, just my speculation on the future. Uh, you know, we have all these interesting uh, but difficult problems. You know, what, are, what is the mechanism behind high temperature superconductivity? Does a exotic topological quantum spin liquid exist in, you know, this or some other system? How do we, uh, you know, design future quantum materials that have properties, of, you know, important technological properties like topological properties and so on? Well, you know, in the age of quantum devices and quantum computers where we can emulate the basic interactions of the material and then uh, produce data, uh, I'm very optimistic about the ability of, of you know, sort of data-driven and machine learning techniques, including neural networks, uh, you know, to make, make uh, you know, basically headway in this. And, and the future I envision is that, you know, we'll hybridize not, you know, our conventional methods like Monte Carlo, perhaps to produce data, to train, you know, representations of wave functions, for example, 
uh, either fully or partially, uh, you know, in uh, collaboration, if you will, with experimental um, uh, data, like the data I showed in the previous slide, and possibly also uh, other methods which uh, don't require uh, data like variational methods. So you have a you have a wave function that is can be represented by these very expressive, very powerful neural networks, uh, and by you know combining data driven and Hamiltonian driven approaches, uh, I, you know I sort of believe it's going to be uh, you know a way of harnessing quantum computers in the near term to make real headway. And just to give you a little taste of this, uh, here's some here's some of our recent work in our group where we compare uh, you know the ground state energy obtained. Uh, uh, by a neur neural network simulation of a certain quantum system using variational updates alone in blue versus a combination of data, which can come, for example, from a quantum computer, uh, trained for a certain amount of epochs, and then a variational simulation afterwards, which you can see obtains a, a significantly better sort of uh, estimate of the ground state energy. And so, keep, you know, stay tuned. This is just my optimistic sort of uh, view of the future. But I believe, you know, quantum simulation will become uh, something that is, you know, not just done on conventional computers, but done in a collaboration between conventional simulations and quantum uh, simulations in the very near future. So, uh, you know, that was just a brief ramble, uh, sort of a philosophical ramble of, I think, where we are and where we're going. And, you know, I, I a chance to thank my mentors, but I'd also really, you know, like to give special thanks to all the students and postdocs and everyone who's made this work possible over the years. I've, I started listing pictures here, but I realized it's basically a lost you know, cause. So if I forgot your picture, sorry, but thanks for everyone who's contributed. And back to you, Rob. Thanks, Roger. So we'll wrap up this talk once again, thanking Roger for a fascinating you, presentation Rob. and congratulating him on his work and his very well-deserved recognition as the 2021 CAP BCMMP Brockhouse Medal recipient.